Okay, so uh, this talk is about how to design a green liner shipping network. So for those of you who are, who are not uh, familiar with uh, liner shipping, then liner ships, they are like buses of the sea. So they operate according to some time schedule on a predefined route. Uh, such a route can take several weeks, typically six, eight weeks. And uh, normally we strive to have weekly departures. So every Wednesday uh, a vessel arrives here. So if the whole round trip takes 42 uh, days, then you deploy six vessels because then one vessel will be coming uh, at your bus stop every, uh, every week. However, it's not possible to make direct connections between all pairs of customers because then you would need simply too many vessels. So often you need to transship uh, your goods. So this corresponds somehow, the big port corresponds to the bus station where people can change from one bus to another uh, in order to make a network where you basically can flow goods from everywhere to everywhere by changing a vessel or bus several times. So this talk is about how can we design such a route net so we make it green uh, and green means using less <coughs> fuel, using the right vessels and many other aspects. So the overall vision is that if you see uh, how much CO2 emission you produce by transporting one ton of goods one kilometer, then modern container vessels, they only emit three grams per ton per kilometer. So this is extremely little compared to a train where it's six times more, truck, it's 15 times more, and an airplane is horrible. It's, uh, how much is it, 200 times uh, more you emit. So um, if we could uh, make liner shipping more efficient, then I'm normally saying that always, if, if you do some optimization, you can probably save some three, four percent. And this would actually uh, correspond to the energy consumption of a city with 100,000 uh, people. So every percent really makes a huge impact on the CO2 emission. But also, the more efficient we can run the business, the more attractive we can make it to customers. And then we can hope that people, instead of taking uh, the truck for their goods, perhaps if we have good connections that serve uh, the customers well, then they will choose the vessel. And also in this way, we can move demands uh, to the vessels and save some uh, overall uh, uh, pollution. Now, uh, we are working with the logistic solutions. So we will not hear anything about building new, more efficient vessels. The good thing about uh, logistic solution is that if you just can change your network without building new vessels, then basically it doesn't cost you anything. You can do it immediately. And also, of course, you also need new vessels, but the more you can postpone the investments in, in, in the new vessels, the better it is also for the environment because building a new vessels, a vessel uh, costs you a lot of energy. You have to get rid of the old vessel, etc. So logistic solutions are actually very green in itself. So what can you do to make a network more efficient? Uh, so uh, if you look at the uh, energy consumption as function of the speed for different vessels, so of course a small vessel does not need so much energy as a huge vessel, but uh, overall you can see the slower you go, the less energy you use, so the solution must be slow steaming. But then you have the, your customers who say, ah, yeah, but I need my goods in time. And if you don't deliver them in goods, then I take the airplane instead. And then we have not done anything green at all. Similarly, if you look at uh, vessel sizes, so this chart shows these are small vessels, medium, uh, up to big vessels, how uh, the, uh, the distribution of costs uh, and this uh, gray uh, box is how much money you use for bunker. So, so, so this is the pollution part. Uh, in order to send 1,000 containers one mile. And you can see the bigger vessels you use, the less emission you have uh, because you use less uh, bunker. So overall, we should, of course, use bigger vessels to be green. But if you end up having, you were planning to have a full vessel, but if you end up having a semi-empty vessel, 
then perhaps you would be much better off using a small vessel which was not so energy efficient, but still it's better to have a full small vessel than a big uh, empty vessel. Finally, as I said, uh, if we want to use big vessels, you probably need some hop and spoke operations. So you need to have some small vessel coming with the cargo, filling it on board on the big vessels. And then you can use these very efficient mega vessels to sail on the long distances. But you need to transship the containers from one vessel to another. This takes time. And then you again have the customer saying, I need my goods in time. Otherwise, I use another way of transportation, going by truck, by train, uh, airplane. So you can see that designing a green network is a lot of compromises. So should you use bigger vessels which are more efficient or, or, in, are you, or you, in that case you risk to have some unused capacity and then you would be better off using smaller vessels. Should you use a hop and spoke approach or should you satisfy the customer demands of having short transportation times? Should you slow steam? or do you need to satisfy, again, the transportation times? Also, if you slow steam, if vessels are sailing slowly, you need more vessels to transport the same amount of goods, so then you need to build more vessels. So what is actually good for the environment? So for human planners, of course, this is a difficult trade-off, and, 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 and uh, having so many aspects, it's almost impossible to foresee the consequences of all this. Uh, decisions. So you definitely need a decision support tool that can help you make this trade off so you get the right balance. Now the good thing is that green liner shipping is a win-win situation. So uh, bunker consumption is by far the biggest operational cost of running a liner shipping network. So uh, the company says okay bunker costs money so, so the less bunker we use the more money we save. I look at it, okay, bunker is emitting some pollution, so if we uh, can reduce the number, the, the amount of uh, bunker used, uh, the better it is. And basically this means that the company and, and our interests are the same, so everybody uh, are interested in it. So how to design such a, a decision support tool? Well, you need to decide which port should you visit, how should the routes look like, should you use small or big vessels, uh, which speed should you operate at? Should you transport all cargo or reject uh, all, some of the cargo? You need to respect the, uh, the customer transit times. There may be some cabotage rules. And to make it even worse, then actually a big uh, network like Maersk Line, they have some 300 uh, routes, 20,000 different somehow customer pairs, OD pairs. So you can see this is really a difficult uh, decision. So we have been working on this problem for the last five, six years, trying both optimal methods. Unfortunately, they can only solve very small problems. Then we have tried some two-stage models where you first design the route and then you try to flow the containers uh, through the network. Uh, and they perform a bit better. Then uh, recently, Karsten and Balakrishnan, they have tried to combine good routes uh, together to form new good routes. Uh, but it's always difficult to assess uh, the, 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 the quality of these solutions. So in order to be able to compare all the different solution methods, uh, we designed some standard benchmark uh, instances, uh, starting from some small ones, just the Baltic Sea, West Africa, to some medium in Mediterranean, to the whole world uh, of all ports. And then we can somehow compare all these approaches and yeah, we get some good results. We can say some three, four, five uh, percent. Uh, but I had hoped that we could do even better. Um, so what is wrong? Well, uh, I've been thinking a lot about what goes wrong. Why can't we improve more than these three, four, five percent? And it's basically because our constraints are too tight. So if we insist on delivering all the goods exactly within the same time frame as before, when we don't really have any freedom to do anything than just ending up with the, the same network as we already have. Also, uh, if a vessel has a capacity on 1,000 uh, containers, then if I need to transport 1,001 container, then I need two vessels. But we are working on forecasts, so, so, so you cannot have so tight constraints. You need some flexibility uh, uh, in the models. 
So if we really want to make some green liner shipping networks, then we need to loosen up the constraints. So this is what the talk will be about, uh, how to loosen up the constraints so we can do it even better. So traditional models, as I said, uh, the most successful, they work on a two-stage model where you start by constructing your routes, then you flow the containers uh, through the network, see how many containers you can flow, how much you earn, uh, how much uh, energy you use, etc. And then if it is not a good solution, then you try some other routes, evaluate it, etc. But flowing the containers through a network it's a very difficult problem if you have 20,000 customers through a complex network. It takes a lot of time. So this means you cannot try many routes and basically you, you, you have no indication of how should you actually construct the routes from the beginning. So normally you start off with the existing routes and this means that you will probably also end up with something which is more or less exactly as the existing routes with a few small improvements. So the idea here is, why don't we do it the other way? Why don't we first flow the containers and then decide if the containers decide how they would like to go, then we make the routes so they satisfy uh, uh, the demands of the containers. So what we want is to somehow construct an efficient backbone network first and then try to make this backbone network into circular routes that look somehow reasonable. So in order to do this, then we need, as I said, we, we need some elasticity. So first of all, instead of having some fixed sizes of uh, vessels, uh, so uh, you can see if my demand is 10,000 containers, well, this vessel is between 5 and 8,000 containers, this one is between 11 and 14. So I don't have anyone, so I end up using a much bigger vessel than I actually need. Well, let's say that all the capacities continue, so you can get a vessel of any size, uh, and in practice, you can do it if you need 10,000 containers, then you could actually alternate between every second week you, you have one of the small, big, small, big, and this will mean that you can get the capacity you want. Okay, so, so in this way, we make the problem simpler. Then, as I told you, bigger vessels are more efficient. So flowing the first container costs you a lot, but then flowing the next containers, it becomes cheaper and cheaper. So also, we assume you have this economy of scale, bigger vessels, per container you flow, it gets cheaper and cheaper. And then uh, the time constraints, instead of insisting that the customer should have his goods exactly on time, so this is your co costs of freighting one container, yeah, if you arrive a day later, probably nothing will, uh, will, will, will uh, happen, but then we impose a small punishment, and if you come much later, then you impose a bigger punishment. On the other hand, if you arrive earlier, then perhaps you can attract more customers, so people, instead of using a train, they, they, they will switch to, to, to uh, using a vessel. So, so, so in this way, you say, okay, you impose some kind of, of, of uh, extra revenue uh, because you can either take a higher price for, for, for a faster connection or uh, you can get more customers. And then the last assumption is that, okay, we don't try to form beautiful circular routes. We assume that you can just buy one connection at a time with the uh, capacity you need, and then the task afterwards will be to try to glue it all together. So the overall model is a kind somehow a multi-commodity flow problem. So, so, so you, the nodes correspond to the ports. Every edge, it has a cost but the cost will depend on how much you are flowing. So the, so the first container is very expensive, but then the next one will be cheaper, and number 10,000, it will be much, much, much cheaper. Then you have a transportation time, and if you want to have different uh, speeds, then you can just add many edges with different uh, transportation times and different edges. And then you have your customers who say, okay, I would like to fly, uh, send five containers from here, three, two of them should arrive here, and three should arrive here and then you need to solve this, uh, this problem. Well, this is actually a quite difficult problem because you have this nonlinear uh, cost function uh, where the more containers you flow, the cheaper it becomes. So uh, uh, the approach I tried was to somehow destroy and rebuild. So, so, so you start with a greedy solution, then you remove uh, parts of the network, then you repair it, remove, repair, remove, repair, using either removing one port, two ports, three ports, one uh, connection, two edges, etc. So, so, so many different neighborhoods. So how does it work? So, so, so this shows you what you can have, you can have this small example with 10 ports 
and you have all these connections, they have a cost, uh, initial cost, uh, a transportation time, and this is how much you are flowing. So you can see this is the problem of a planner. How on earth shall I design a good network uh, for, for, for this? I have no idea how it should look like. But then running this uh, somehow tr algorithm to try to form the backbone, then already after the greedy heuristic, you can see it starts to get some shape. So, 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 so a lot of the cargo tries to accumulate on some thick edges. So there's a lot of flow on these uh, edges because then you have the economy of scale that you share one big vessel and it becomes much cheaper. And then if you do this ruin and recreate where you spoil the solution and uh, try to repair it again uh, many thousand times, then you can see now it starts to look like quite a decent uh, network and also your operational costs have decreased a lot. But the problem is, okay, so how do you turn this into a real network because this gives you only the backbone and you don't know how to turn it into uh, an efficient network. So um, this summer I supervised with, uh, with Rune, not uh, Rune sitting there, but another Rune, uh, a project with uh, two master thesis students who tried, okay, let's try this on a real big scale network. So this is what they found for the world's small uh, network. How should the backbone of uh, a global network look like? And uh, you can see that we have some thick connections from Asia to Europe, uh, from Europe to North America. This connection, of course, because we have it on a map, uh, so we are going from Asia to North America, of course we would have chosen the other way around the world, but this is the way I can display it in two dimensions. Um, the darker the colors, the bigger vessels, and the thinner, uh, the, the lighter, it means that we have small connections. So this gives us somehow the solution, the ideal backbone. But unfortunately, this is not real roots. They just somehow you have this connection, it just ends here, and you don't know how to get the vessel back again. So we need to make it into some meaningful roots. So how can you make it into meaningful roots? Well, uh, one a greedy approach is to say, OK, we start with a fat edge, deploy a vessel for that, and then we gradually add more and more edges until the round trip takes some six, seven, eight weeks. And we can do this either sequentially, so first the first vessel creates a route, then the next vessel creates a good route, the third vessel, etc. But then you can end up with the situation that the first vessel takes all the good connections, then the second one gets all the semi-good, and the last one gets really some garbage. So another approach is to try it in parallel, so every vessel gets one good connection, and then they try to add more and more connections until you somehow have shared it, 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 it fairly. So this was the idea, and it's very fast to run because if you have already this backbone network, you know which edges to choose, and you can generate many different routes. Unfortunately, the solutions are not brilliant, uh, so you need to repair it. And uh, the idea is that you, okay, again, you try to destroy your, ne your, your network by removing some uh, ports, uh, connections, and then you try to improve it again by, by uh, reconnecting the ports. And each time you have to evaluate your network, try to flow all the uh, containers through the network and see, is it actually a better solution or is it a worse solution? So in this work, uh, the two master thesis students, they tried both to insert, remove ports, uh, 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 take a given service and just say, okay, I don't want to service this demand, uh, I throw it away, or on a whole route to, to remove all ports with a low demand, hoping that in this way you can get rid of, 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 of uh, the bad customers and, and improve it. So again, this was put into a framework, trying many, 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 many iterations of it. Um, but as I said, for each iteration you need to see, okay, what will be the effect of flowing all the containers through the network, how many customers will get their goods on time, etc. And this is a difficult problem. So in this project we tried a quick and dirty method where we used some Lagrangian methods just to very quickly flow the containers into, uh, through the network. The disadvantage is that well, it was very quick, but you were actually up to 10% away from how good you could do it if you actually used a better method to flow the containers. But actually, this does, it seems not to be a problem because if you always know that you are 10% away from the best solution, 
it still gives you a direction in which way you should go if you want to insert a new port, remove a port. So if it's just consistently always 10% worse, uh, then, then you can use this very quick and dirty method to, to, to somehow get a quick view of how will the flow look like. And then uh, it gives you a direction, should, where, uh, should I add this port, should I remove it, etc. And this means that you can make much, much more uh, iterations. And here you can see the world's small uh, solution where you have some real network. So now it's real circular routes uh, running uh, uh, around the world. And uh, uh, this is uh, somehow uh, the final network constructed uh, by this method. So uh, what are the solution times? You can see this, is, this approach is actually quite fast. So the world large, the biggest instance can be solved in, in, in one hour, uh, the world small in uh, uh, well, 20 minutes and, and, and so on. And the small instances can be solved in a few uh, seconds. What about the solutions? Well, this is comparison to the best uh, known solution uh, for these instances. Then you can see, for instance, for world large, nobody could solve that before. So, so at least we get a solution. Uh, world small, uh, this is how much, how many millions of dollars we are earning per month. So it has been improved from 44 to 50. But this was using flowing the containers just by a quick and dirty method. So you can actually, when you are finished, you can flow the containers using a more expensive method. So you get a very detailed picture of how the containers are flown. And this way you can actually improve the objective function to 58. So you can see the dark ones, this is the best uh, known solution. And for the small ones, this approach, yeah, it's not bad, but, but it's not so performing so well. If you look at the numbers, you can see for the world small instance, actually we were able to obtain a 30% improvement over the best known uh, solution. And where does this improvement come from? Well, less energy, we can flow more containers for the customers, we use less vessels. So everything is which somehow contributes to making a more green network. But if you look at the key performance indicators of this network, well, we reject quite a bit of the cargo. So it's on 10, 15% of the cargo we reject. And this may be the price of trying to make a green network that if, uh, if we insist on servicing all customers, then we end up with the network we already have. But if we want to make it more green, then we have to sacrifice some customers and then hopefully some other liner shipping company will pick them up uh, uh, in their network. You can see that uh, because we start with the, uh, somehow building a backbone network first, then actually many customers get their uh, cargo delivered using a direct service. So, so, so it's, uh, they don't need any transshipments. The number of transshipments is generally quite low. Um, the bad thing is that uh, the model tries to slow steam as much as it can. So we don't do it within the time limit uh, uh, that is given currently. And this is definitely the weak part of the algorithm, that it's not good at handling the time limits. So this is where it needs to be improved in order to make it somehow uh, usable in practice. So uh, to conclude this talk, uh, if you want to make a green liner shipping network, you need some elasticity. You cannot insist on doing everything as you used to do. Do. You need to reject some customers, you need to, uh, to, 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 to uh, perhaps be a little bit slower, etc. Um, I believe that this idea of first constructing a backbone structure may be the right way of, of seeing the problem and then try to form the roots. And as you can see, the results seem to be promising if we can also uh, get the uh, transportation time uh, quite reasonable. So what are the advantages of having such a, uh, uh, a decision support tool? Well, it means that you actually can design a network every hour if you want. Uh, so uh, you can make networks for each season. So when there's high season, you deploy more vessels. When there's low season, uh, you can use less vessels. Uh, and in this way, save a lot of energy. Uh, you can react quickly if the market suddenly changes. We saw it after the financial crisis where the demand suddenly dropped to half the size. We were spending a lot of energy transporting nothing. Um, and 
what I believe is the most important thing when you negotiate alliances, because if you really want to use the big mega vessels, which are very efficient, you need to, uh, to, to, to make an alliance with, with other companies. But uh, liner shipping companies are afraid of these alliances because it's very difficult to predict what will be the consequences of making an alliance and sharing uh, this big vessel. But such a model gives you actually a possibility to, when you're sitting at the table, I, in one hour you can find out, okay, what will be the consequences of, of making this alliance? Will it be better, greener, or will it be worse? And uh, you are much stronger. So. Thanks to our sponsors, thanks to all my, all my uh, co-authors, and that was the end. So thank you very much. Yeah, have you looked at the structure of the network before and after? And yeah, it looks uh, quite a different, uh, but, but, but the biggest difference is that um, uh, generally, it, it's slow steaming much more uh, than, than uh, the current network. And it's basically because in this simple model, the time constraints of the customers have not, are not part of the model. So, so of course, uh, uh, it's, it's cheating wherever it can. Uh, and, and we need to have these constraints to make it more realistic. Uh, but uh, you could see that there were much more direct connections than currently. Uh, so, so, so I think this is a consequence of starting with making the backbone. So, so you try to connect all the major ports with direct connections first, and then you add some extra uh, ports to, to, to make it real routes. Uh, so this is probably the main difference, where currently vessels, they sail and try to pick up a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit and then take the long distance, and again, deliver, deliver, deliver. Uh, so, so structurally, uh, they seem to be a bit different. But of course, you have some major trade paths, and you will recognize exactly the same trade paths as, as, as uh, in the current network. Yeah. For example, the, uh, how many port calls do you make in each region by the really, really big vessels? Uh, do you say something I haven't else? analyzed this part of it, but generally, since we reject so much cargo, so we don't make so many of the somehow small port visits. Uh, and and, and uh, big liner shipping companies, they would not be happy about this. Uh, but, but I think if you want to make a green liner shipping network, you have to, you have to sacrifice something. Uh, so, so you must reject some customers in order to make it more efficient and then hope that somebody else will uh, transport this cargo. Um, so you cannot basically try to operate everything everywhere all the same uh, so yeah yeah uh, my name is Brian from blue technology and um, I have a question because you say that uh, small port visits you have to uh, accept that you cannot uh, call these ports and uh, some will be sacrificed but I fear that uh, this is the common way where you uh, leave some areas out of uh, global trade and uh, you're actually pushing uh, toward truck transport, if, yeah. if that's the case. Um, I, I, I can add a few comments to this. So this was the key performance indicators that we are rejecting some 10-15%. But this is actually when, when, when we only have used the quick and dirty way of flowing the containers. So if we use the more detail, then, then, then actually we don't reject so much cargo. So, so, so these, these numbers are a little bit overestimating how much cargo uh, we reject. But uh, these instances, uh, they are artificially constructed. So even other algorithms are also not able to, 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 to flow all the containers. So, so, so uh, I cannot disclose, I'm not able, allowed to, to work directly on the MERSC line network. So we have taken some MERSC similar uh, uh, networks or demands, uh, but, but nobody knows whether it's at all possible to flow all containers uh, in an efficient way. So I don't expect that the optimal solution is to flow everything. But of course, it would be interesting to try it on a real network when the model is mature and see if you are able to flow everything. Um, but uh, taking your comment into account, so, so, so of course, this is a tool for the liner shippers 
and they look at the world, of course, from their own side. But if we would like to make a holistic view on it, then, then you could build into the model, if you reject the cargo, what will be the energy consumption by going by truck to the nearest uh, port. And then you could actually get this into the model, so, so you get the right trade-off uh, between bringing a big vessel to, to, to a small port, or is it better to take it uh, by, by, by truck to a bigger port, and then you don't have to sail so far with, 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 with your vessel. So I think it, uh, the model could be extended to, to make somehow a holistic energy uh, view on it and, and make the right trade-off. I'm not sure the liner shippers would pay for it because they just want to make money. So, <laughs> but, 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 but it would be interesting to see what is, from a global perspective, what is the right way of, of, of doing it. Because getting the big vessel to these small ports, you spend a lot of energy on this. So, 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 so it's difficult to know. Uh, perhaps if you skip as one of the small ports, then you can slow steam on the rest of the distance and then you save much more energy. So, 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 so it, uh, as I said, it's difficult to make these trade-offs, but, but making a model that can handle it uh, can give you, hopefully, a better guess than uh, just following your gut feeling. I can imagine the dependency function has a big influence on yes. that. How did you settle on the one that you're using, and how big yeah, is the we, influence? We, we ended up, so, so, so in my uh, simple prototype, I had this penalty function, and I just used some gut feelings. So, so we have been working with MERSC for many years, and we know somehow what their punishments used to be, and then try to make it a nice, smooth function. But of course, this needed to be tuned to... Uh, uh, the advantage of that the algorithm is quite fast is that, uh, okay, you can try one punishment function and then you can give you the results to, 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 to the planners and they say, oh, this is horrible because so many customers don't get their goods on time and this is our best customers. Then you can just adjust the, the, the penalty function and, and try it again. Uh, uh, in the results I showed from, from the master thesis, they didn't use this penalty function, so, so they just ignored the transportation times. And uh, in this way, this is also why uh, a lot of the cargo doesn't do it on time. We are only focusing on minimizing the energy. A side question, um, how about penalizing rejected cargo to kind of fix this problem of rejecting it? Yeah, this will be somehow in line with the previous uh, question that, that, that if you don't take this cargo, then you need to find another way of transporting it, which is more expensive. So, so I think it could be built into it. Uh, and, and, and at least Merck Line, they, they want to operate all the customers exactly as before. But I'm trying to, to convince them that this is not the right way of doing it because if you want to be more green, you have to make some changes. But each time you reject some customers, you have the possibility to take some other customers, which perhaps are exactly on the path you are following. So, 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 so it doesn't need to be bad. Just a quick one. Uh, have you taken into consideration any uh, requirements from the customers or shippers in the study? Uh, this is still a prototype. Uh, some of our other models are very, very advanced, taking all uh, constraints into account. But if you take all constraints into account, you just end up with the same network as you have already. Uh, the answer was no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm surprised with this zero transshipment for Baltic too. What does it mean? Does it mean that all connections are direct? Yes. Uh, be, be, because there's just one vessel sailing around in the Baltic, so, 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 so. Be, because it's such a small instance and the Baltic Sea is so small, so, so, so uh, you can easily operate it with basically one route spanning uh, all customers. Uh. But this approach is not designed for the small instances, it's for, 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 for solving the big world instances where these trade-offs are much more uh, difficult to make. Okay, I think, thank you again, David. Okay, thank you.